Good morning, and welcome to the 10th annual JWB Children's Summit, The Power of Connections. My name is Patrice Moore, and I am the chair of the Juvenile Welfare Board. As we get started, it is my pleasure to invite the St. Petersburg College President, Dr. Tanja Williams, to the podium for a warm host welcome. All right, it's time to rise and shine, rise and grind, get up and make it work, and have a great day, right? Yeah. Okay, you've had your coffee, which is critical for many of us in the morning. Thank you so much, Judge Moore and Chief Milliken, uh, Beth Houghton, and the other board members. Thank you for allowing me to bring a warm welcome this morning. You're sitting at the St. Petersburg College's Seminole campus, uh, one of the 11 learning sites that we have here in Pinellas County. And uh, we're very proud of our relationship with the city of Seminole and the support that they bring to this community and to St. Petersburg College. St. Petersburg College has been a partner with JWB for a long time. We actually feel like we're family. And so today, I know we're gonna learn a lot about partnerships and how we come together and do things for the good of our children and our community. The thing about JWB is this. If we had no JWB, we will have a larger amount of underserved, underprepared families in Pinellas County. And so sometimes when you have a household name that's been around a long time, it becomes, it kind of falls on deaf ears. You forget, oh, JWB, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, you let JWB walk off the farm and find out what Pinellas County would be like. St. Petersburg College and JWB share very similar goals. Our goal is to make sure that we build healthy families so that individuals can have better jobs, so families can have better lives. That's our new strategic plan, better jobs, better lives. No one wants to grow up and be poor. There's not one child that JWB is working with who's saying, I can't wait to struggle in life. I can't wait to be underemployed. I can't wait to live in poverty. See, when JWB's working with these families, the children still have that little glimmer in their eyes. They still have that hope. And that's what JWB draws out of them. SPC's job is to work with the parents. Because no matter what JWB does to help these children, they still have to go back into that house. And so we need to make sure that that family is strong. My team did some research. I would take the credit, but I didn't. <laughs> um, and they said, Dr. Williams, did you know JWB served 29,000 families this year? Did you guys know that? <laughs> and they asked me, did you know 96% of those families are abuse free? That means they're not living dysfunctionally. I mean, that's a big input into the community. So if you're sitting here today, you're sitting here because you are either a partner or a potential partner. Because if you walk out of this room and not be a partner, then something's wrong with you. Just saying. Just saying. Beth knows not to give me the microphone. But I'm hoping that as we hear our speakers today and as we work together, we look at those five pillars that JWB has built and really dig deep, not just in our pockets, but in our, in our time and our talent to see how can we contribute to those five pillars to make sure that all in Pinellas have a great life. I know that how I grew up if JWB was a part of my life, it would have been so much easier for my family. And so I hope that you come today thirsty for learning, ready for being a part of the solution, and let's go JWB. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And you said it so eloquently, as JWB works with our children, the people in the community such as St. Pete College helps to work with the mothers and the fathers and the families and the caretakers because it does take a village. For more than seven decades, JWB has invested in Pinellas County children to improve their futures and strengthen their lives. And today marks another milestone 
the 10th year of gathering community leaders together for a summit totally dedicated to children. I've gotten, I've often heard Beth say, our county, in our county, children represent only 16% of the total population. But I can tell you from my decades serving as a, decades? <laughs> 13 years, not decades. <laughs> wow, I can't, <laughs> I'm only, I'm only 25. <laughs> Serving as a unified family court judge for the Sixth Judicial Circuit, they, that they are 100% of our future. Kids are 100% of our future. They will be the leaders of tomorrow. They'll teach the children in our schools. They'll treat and heal the sick. They will respond to our emergencies, keep our neighborhoods safe. They'll run for local governments and serve in our courts, and not just come to court as litigants, but they'll serve in our courts. They'll stand where I'm standing today, and they'll talk about how we best served, raised, and supported, and lifted up the next generation. And that's because of all of you that are in this audience. And who they become is 100% dependent on us today. No one stands, no one understands this better than my colleagues at, at JWB. So as I call your name, if you're in the audience, please stand, Ms. Kristen Nage. Pinellas County School Superintendent Kevin Hendrick. The Honorable Chris Latvala, P Pinellas County Commissioner. Past Board Chair Mr. Michael McCurak. The Honorable Sarah Malo, uh, the, the official public defender. And unable to join us today is Chief Jim Milligan, our boy vice chair. Mr. Brian Unks Jr. and the Honorable Bruce Follett, who is our state attorney, and Ms. Melissa Rutland. That is your board. It is a pleasure to, thank you, thank you. It is a pleasure to serve with you and I thank you for service to our children. Our JWB leadership teams, I'm sorry, our JWB leadership team, leaders from JWB Mid-South and North County Community Councils, please stand if you're in the audience. And legacy member of our Juvenile Welfare Board, if you're in the audience, would you please stand? Thank you for your service. I will acknowledge all elected officials as a group, and I know that everybody is important in the room, but I'm gonna acknowledge everyone as a group, please, and thank you. Please understand that those are my rules. <laughs> if we have any legislators in the group and or their designees, please stand. Pinellas County Commissioners in the group, please stand. Any county and city officials, please stand. Any Pinellas County School Board members, please stand. And anyone who thinks that they're important enough to stand, please stand. <laughs> I would like to have our JWB, uh, JWB funded program leaders, if you guys would please stand. Please, if we funded your agencies, please stand. Thank you, thank you. Plus a dozen, plus dozens of our organizations and partners uh, that we are that we have partnered with and for our different campaigns. If you are in the audience, would you please stand? Okay. This was a great visual of and uh, introducing our theme today, and it's called the power of connections, which really resonates with me as well. For me, it's simple. We need each other. We need each other. JWB can't do it alone and you can't do it alone, but together we are powerful. Whether we're connecting in our homes, our schools, our neighborhoods, or our community, human to human, group to group, organization to organization, let me flip my page and thank you, we cannot exist without each other, and we cannot do this work alone. And I'm especially excited that this morning, we'll hear from the experts in the field of children's mental health. And children's mental health are so important right now. And thank you for what you're doing for our children and their mental health. With a special look behind the scenes at the power of human connections and the impact of social media and screen time for our youth well-being. Connections really do matter especially when it comes to the future of our children, and we need to make sure that they're getting the right connections. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Beth Houghton, 
our JWB CEO, and a passionate advocate for our children. And she is the dot connector for our kids. Good morning, Beth. That's a hard duo to follow. <laughs> so not fair. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Moore, and, and thank you always, Tanja, for inspiring us to be more, to do more, and to be there for each other. Um, the Juvenile Welfare Board has been part of the fabric of this community for a very long time, for over 75 years. It's invested in partnerships, innovation, and advocacy for for children and to strengthen the lives of children and their families. We've done that in a whole variety of ways over those 75 years. Uh, 75 years ago, a foster care system did not exist, for instance. A juvenile justice system did not exist. So there are ways in which we filled in gaps 75 years ago that we don't anymore, and other issues and concerns and knowledge have emerged over that time that inform the work we continue to do. So as we reflect uh, upon all of this, we recognize a variety of things. One, as Judge Moore pointed out, we do not do this alone. Uh, every single person in this room and so many more are part of either making the connection so that things happen or representing organizations that are on the ground in the trenches with children every day, with families every day, seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly, and trying to make a difference in that moment, in that day. And anything that, that I talk about or we talk about that JWB did, we did it with you. Uh, we, we were maybe the convener, maybe the funder, maybe the researcher that helped inform the work, we were the nudger, we were the putting people together, uh, let's talk this out, we're hearing this from this and that from that and they're not connecting, well, let's see if we can get them together. We do all of those things, but we're really uh, keenly aware that for the most part, we're not the ones that are face to face with the kids every day and you all represent uh, that work, that hands-on work. We reflect on JWB's work and uh, impact last year, and as we thought about it, we, the, the word connection rose up to be the theme for this event and, uh, and maybe the, the best descriptor over some of the things that occurred over this last year that we thought were important, or important things to pay attention to going forward. So because learning and mental health begin at birth, we increased our investment in the zero to three space with new programming and a campaign focused on nurturing early connections and healthy, uh, healthy development for babies. Uh, a campaign called Turbo Babies, who I hope most or many of you already know about. Uh, it is off to a wonderful launch uh, with the goal of not just being a cute bag and you know looking cool, but actually impacting the ways in which parents easily learn to interact with their babies and ones and twos, uh, so that they can uh, they can be their children's best and first teachers. Uh, we work with partners to make that happen. Uh, uh, two of our early partners are the Department of Health with their uh, with, with their home visiting programs, where home visitors will literally walk through, this is what you can do with your baby with this piece, and this is what you can do with your baby with this piece. Model it, make it real. Uh, and and Evera Health, uh, the pediatricians there are using these in well child visits to not only use those tools to assess how a kid is doing developmentally, but also model how those things can be used looking over and, and seeing, seeing a doctor and saying, is that accurate? What? Okay, you're really doing that? Okay, good. <laughs> Just checking. Um, so we continue to our work to ensure healthy connections for children. And we'll hear today 
uh, from, from our amazing speakers just how important those connections are for our kids. They're important for us, they're certainly important for our kids. We invested as JWB another $17.1 million into the community to give children their best opportunities to learn, thrive, and succeed. Uh, these strategic connections included new innovative programs to address unmet needs and also to fund the stabilization of the workforce of all the folks in all our programs who support kids and provide services for kids. For JWB, uh, from 2020 to, or, or 22-23 was a year of creative connections where we shared our data, expertise, and best practices with others for an even greater impact to our children. We're an open book. We produce and gather a significant amount of data about kids, and we are always welcome, you, know, you are always welcome to tap us for any of that you think might be helpful for any purpose. So at this time, let's dim the lights for a look back on the work and accomplishments of JWB and our partners this last year. The Juvenile Welfare Board has always had a taste for innovation. It's part of our fabric and written into our mission to invest in innovative ways to strengthen children's lives. But we don't do this alone. We form partnerships that generate new ideas expand the brain trust, and maximize resources. And we invest in these partnerships, leading the way to better futures for kids. As we reflect on JWB's work and impact last year, one word comes to mind, connections. Early connections to make the most of baby's first 1,000 days, healthy human connections so youth feel a sense of belonging and hope, strategic connections with investments in new, innovative programs to address unmet needs, and creative connections where the promise and impact of our best practices are reaching beyond the walls of JWB for the good of all children. Last year, JWB allocated $95 million to strengthen the lives of children and families in Pinellas County. This included roughly $5 million for new, innovative programs, plus another five for workforce stabilization, all of which contributed to a record $17.1 million in new investments for kids last fiscal year. As a result, 70,000 children and families were served by 100 quality programs provided by 53 nonprofits. Plus, tens of thousands more benefited from JWB's campaigns, initiatives, and collective impact. For example, 7,000 parents received life saving education and baby bags geared towards infant safe sleep. 3,000 kids participated in free swim and water safety lessons. 17,000 books were given away to help early readers become future leaders. And 700,000 free meals went to kids to fight childhood hunger. Plus another 5 million plus meals thanks to JWB's bulk food investments. JWB also engaged a consultant to better inform our fatherhood collaboration in its role supporting and giving dads a voice, and increased annual funding to our family services resource pool to strengthen and support those caring for children. We warmly welcome two new members to our JWB board, Kristen Nage and Melissa Rutland and our three community councils hosted family-centered events, released new community support funds, and informed JWB's work by serving on procurement review teams. JWB-sponsored trainings and events benefited thousands. From our annual Children's Summit, where leaders convened to imagine the future for kids, 
a conference focused on self-care for out-of-school time provider staff, and JWB's annual awards luncheon, where boots on the ground, kids' first winners were celebrated, promising youth received educational scholarships, and our second ever Dillinger McCabe Leadership Awardee was named in a surprise announcement to close the event. We onboarded a total of 14 new staff last year, bringing a wide range of expertise to JWB, made improvements to internal procurement processes, adopted new data systems for increased efficiencies, laid groundwork for a new stockroom position and van to support JWB's outreach efforts, and held our annual team building event where JWB staff were celebrated for crushing it all year. The first three years of a baby's life are critical to shaping their brains and their futures. Last year, JWB launched Turbo Babies, an early childhood public awareness campaign that reached more than 8,000 parents and caregivers with supercharged messaging and materials. We also funded five new early childhood development programs invested in a support position for those seeking early childhood education degrees, and planned events to support grandparents raising their grandchildren. Early connections matter. Learning begins at birth, so does a child's mental health. From day one, babies begin to understand a world of loving, attentive, and dependable adults or not. In these formative years, a baby's brain chemistry is impacted for life. You know, what, when I had a chance to talk to the JVB board about the importance of the early years, that they were moved not only by the, the scientific information that 80% of the baby's brain develops in the first three years, mm -hmm. but by the fact that the brain development is shaped by the everyday experiences that baby is having in her house, in her neighborhood, in her community, with her family. And I knew that because of what you all taught me, the case that was really made to JPP about the importance of those um, early months and, and uh, years of the baby's life. JWB continues the important work of promoting children's mental health and wellness by reducing stigma and fostering healthy connections. We're increasing access by integrating behavioral health and support services within pediatric practices. Last year, nearly 15,000 children were screened by pediatric providers for early detection and intervention, and more than 6,000 behavioral health visits occurred within those settings. JWB's Children's Mental Health Initiative is continuing to increase capacity among our local pediatricians. We're getting them better equipped at identifying, diagnosing, and treating the lower to moderate mental health conditions while making behavioral health and other support services available within the child's medical home. We're focusing on public awareness and family engagement. We're hoping to normalize conversations around mental health. Our goal has been and continues to be getting further upstream, focusing on prevention and early intervention. The best thing about the program really has been the feedback from the parents. They are so grateful to be able to have their children's mental health needs met here. And also, they just, they don't have so much fear. There's not so much stigma about going to, say, a psychiatrist as opposed to having your needs met by your pediatrician. Last year, JWB awarded $6.5 million for new programs that align with one of JWB's five strategic goals. And the majority are focused on early childhood development and the prevention of abuse and neglect. JWB's 12 new programs have really gone the extra mile towards innovation. 
They're searching out and filling unmet needs and gaps and really getting to how we can change the trajectory of a child's future. Without a doubt, our new programs are strategic. They're designed to reach and engage some of our most vulnerable families for the families who may not be ready to seek support today, but could be tomorrow. They are increasing our footprint in early childhood, building capacity for high quality early learning and offering behavioral health interventions to prevent abuse and neglect. When the YMCA of the Suncoast revised its strategic plan in 2017, we added a very important component, which was how we can help prevent child sexual abuse. We are so proud of our partnership with JWB, where we're able to educate both children and parents on what grooming behavior look like that will help prevent child sexual abuse. JWB continues to gain momentum as an innovative thought leader for kids. Taking a community approach, we shared our mapping capabilities to measure child opportunity at the neighborhood level. We were invited to roundtable discussions at the White House to help ensure accurate mental health storylines in TV and films. Our Sleep Baby Safely campaign was replicated statewide. 19 counties now share its consistent message and materials to protect babies from sleep-related suffocation every night and nap. JWB staff were also recognized and celebrated across the region and state for their stellar work and contributions for kids. Given our broad range of expertise on key children's issues, we are frequently invited to the table to have a leadership role. We have a community mindset. If it's about kids, JWB is there. We're moving forward with great intentionality, making not only creative connections, but also courageous ones. So when our influence, expertise, and ideas take hold in other places, it's value added for all children. From the earliest of days, we come into this world craving the presence of others, longing for human connections. For more than 75 years, JWB has been uniquely positioned as a leader, a convener, and a dot connector for kids. Our goal is that children in Pinellas County are ready to learn, thrive, and succeed in schools, homes, and neighborhoods that are healthy and safe. It's rooted in our guiding values that we embrace collaboration, pursue innovation, and value every child. That's the power of connections. Thank you. I I get uh, goosebumps on some of that. So, um, From our earliest days, human relationships matter. They matter to each one of us in this room. As children develop and grow, social connections form. And because people are social creatures, a sense of belonging is a fundamental need that we all have. Children who feel connected to families, to schools, to neighborhoods, and other meaningful groups develop a sense of belonging, which is associated with mental and physical health benefits. We also know that screen time and social media use among children and teens is increasing dramatically. Like many activities, gaming, social media, and screen time come with both benefits and risks. Today, we'll hear from two experts about how belonging boosts kids' mental health and how screen time and social media can affect it. 
We'll learn about the latest research and data and discover practical tools that youth and their families can access to foster healthy connections. Uh, this is not a, uh, an easy one and done subject. It has a lot of depth and we are continuing to learn in real time as this experiment is going on in front of us and in our community. So before I introduce our featured speakers, I wanted to give some context about efforts already underway in this community and kind of how we came to this place of lifting up particularly concerns about social and digital media to the whole community. Um, the Health and Human Services Leadership Board, lovingly called the HHSLB, not that you may need to know that, but um, is, uh, is a group of leaders across the community. It reflects three county commissioners, three school board members, three juvenile welfare board members, and the sheriff, who have gotten together periodically over at least 10 years to try to align the work that those organizations are doing around a significant issue within the community. So among those has been homelessness, certainly not solved, but there was a real lack of alignment in the way in which each of those funding organizations or service providing organizations approached homelessness. Uh, and we came together to, to some best practices that then showed up in our work and throughout the community. Similarly, uh, issues around mental health arose some number of years ago. Uh, different issues with different populations, and in that case, there was sort of a divide and conquer. Uh, the county took on the primary responsibility, if you will, to look at the system of care or the lack of a system of care uh, for Pinellas County for adults and the Juvenile Welfare Board took more leadership relative to children. And one of the things that you saw emerge from that on the children's side was it, what you saw in the video, embedding uh, mental health professionals within uh, large uh, pediatric practices and adding training and support to pediatricians so that they were very capable within their license and their expertise to manage frontline medications for kids for things like depression or anxiety or ADHD, which one, helped break down the stigma because this was a place that families had already been going. This was a doctor they already knew who'd been taking care of them. Uh, and also relieved the the deeper end mental health system from all of those lower acuity uh, families and kids and cases that really didn't need to rise to the next level. So it it created capacity in essence where there there had been been and continues to be strained capacity. So when this group, uh, as I described, these board members met last November. Uh, largely with the leadership and urging of uh, school board member Laura Hine. And Laura is, there we are. Yay, Laura. Uh, Laura really raised up, what are we going to do about the impact of social and digital media on our kids? And um, at, at that point in time, everybody was wringing their hands about it, and, and uh, a lot of big studies had come out, and the experts will, will reference those. Uh, but there wasn't a lot about what, what a community could effectively do or families could effectively do that was practical um, and, and how to understand, you know, wh when, it, when it's, what kind of screen time is okay and what kind of screen time isn't uh, and, and on and on. So when we met last November as the HHSLB, we focused on these impacts and heard one of the in part, one of the presentations you'll hear today. And what we are continuing to do, uh, both in this case, the school board and JWB, is to gather the youth voice uh, from a variety of sources. The, the school board is, uh, will be conducting a survey with kids. Uh, you may have heard about the survey relative to access to devices. That's one thing, but there will be another survey related more to 
the use of and the impact of digital and social media. And I don't expect we'll get those results till May or maybe even June. Sooner would be great, but. Um, and we, we have other access to youth groups to be able to ask those questions and understand what, the, what social media, what digital media means to them. Um, adult, we, we don't need to listen to my generation or a generation younger. We really need to listen hard to the generations uh, who, who are being impacted by it today. So what we heard, and much of what you'll hear today, we hope will start to kind of level set the whole community in its knowledge about some of the pluses and minuses, the benefits and risks, the paradox uh, of social media and youth. Um, so much of our energy and our impetus on this topic started and came from the school board. We have to recognize that kids spend X amount of time every day in school and they spend a lot of other time with family in their homes or with friends or wherever. So we are seeking to figure out, and we're at the front end of this, what would a community effort look like? You know, would it be a campaign? Would it be something else? But at least let's align our messages so that we're making the, the best difference uh, for our kids. Um, let's see, I'm going to say, okay. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce both of our speakers, and I'm going to introduce them both at the same time, and then they're, they're friendly, collaborative folks, so they'll, they'll tag team. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Jennifer Katzenstein, who's the co-director of the Center for Behavioral Health, director of psychology, neuropsychology, and social work at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and Associate Professor of Clinical Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Uh, she's also the mother of Teddy, who's a really cute kid. Um, her presentation is titled, Social Media and Mental Health, Understanding the Impact for Youth. And Dr. Whitney Raglan Bignall, Associate Clinical Director for the On Our Sleeves Movement for, the children's, mental, for children's Mental Health, uh, presented by our healthcare partner, Baycare Kids, on our sleeves. She will present the importance of belonging for kids and tools for social media. Thank you both, and please welcome them to the podium. Well, good morning, everyone. It's truly an honor to be here with you all today and so many amazing leaders in our community. Thank you all for everything you do, and a huge thank you um, to my co-presenter today for joining us from Ohio. As we were meeting for this, I kept saying, I promise the weather will be better than Ohio. Um, but it has been a little bit chillier here for us. Um, this passion for me really arose not only because as a pediatric mental health provider, I was seeing more and more children having challenges understanding social media and then having the social media and information that was coming at them each day impacting their overall mental health. And for me, this was rooted in understanding very early on in my career that mental health conditions truly are a diagnosis of childhood. Before the pandemic, we were looking at one in five children experiencing a mental health diagnosis. But as we went through the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen those rates really rise to one in three to one in four. And while we were in a mental health epidemic, right, before the pandemic, we've continued to see that worsen given a lack of providers, which JWB has been an amazing collaborator in supporting the workforce development, but also these needs increasing and having fewer providers and parents not really understanding what's happening and waiting, waiting to seek treatment because you know, we often have some stigma surrounding mental health, we don't understand, or we push the bounds of what normal is, and that just becomes our daily life. But what we know is about half of all mental health concerns can be diagnosed prior to age 14, and 75% of them can be diagnosed prior to age 24. So if we can get early intervention and early diagnosis for our kids, they're likely to have a brighter future, to have a higher quality of life, and then also get the treatment that they need to live to their fullest potential. However, what we've seen is about half of kids will wait 10 years or more for appropriate diagnosis and treatment. And really what we saw escalate during the pandemic was the need for crisis services. 
We weren't identifying these kids early. We were not getting them the services that they needed earlier. And then we were seeing them present to our emergency rooms. You were hearing stories, right, of emergency rooms just overflowing with patients. And at Johns Hopkins All Children's, we were having challenges along with our community partners managing all of the kids who needed crisis. We've seen some of that um, kind of even out back to pre-pandemic numbers, um, but it continues to really reinforce to me the need for everyone in this room, for the community, for our, all of our community partners to be focused on behavioral health. And so when Beth and Laura came to me about social media, knowing that it was a passion of mine, um, I was so honored because the way that social media and digital media impacts our youth is significant. And as Beth mentioned, I have a six, almost seven-year-old who calls me bruh, or bro, <laughs> right? Who also calls me sus, which I'm not sus, <laughs> but I've learned a lot of terms I wouldn't have otherwise known. Um, but he knows and he's getting information, right? It's not a joke, it's brought all the time. <laughs> it's getting challenging. And, <laughs> and I'm a, I know, and then Beth tells me, just wait till they're teenagers. I'm like, no thank you, because he just, I last, the, was, we won't get into this morning. But, <laughs> and that's really as a parent and as a psychologist, right? Theoretically, I have all the skills I should have to do this, and I don't. <laughs> and also, I have all of this knowledge that I'll share with you today, but a lot of this is aspirational, right? This is how do we balance our lives? How do we understand that digital media, that social media is our children's future? And how do we understand that as adults? How do we teach them to be appropriate consumers? of that information and how do we as adults also be appropriate consumers of everything that we see um, in the digital media. Because what do we know from every study that we see, every piece of information, children begin interacting with digital media as young as four months. Um, if you're a mom, a dad, a caregiver who was up in the middle of the night maybe feeding a baby early on, what were we doing? scrolling, <laughs> trying to stay awake. And so right off the bat, from a very young age, our kids are having that exposure to social media and just digital equipment that is a part of our daily lives in general. A majority of children are watching TV and are online every day at least for two hours or more, even though we really want to keep that two hours and under. And sometimes it is a factor of us as adults trying to get through the day as well. During the pandemic, I won't lie, I was chucking gummy bears down the hallway. Um, trying to keep my kid busy while I was giving talks virtually, right? <laughs> like just how did we manage our daily lives at a time when it was so challenging and everyone at home? And so during that time, during the pandemic, we had to rely um, for many of us on digital media, on schools being um, in some way, you know, electronic or on screens because we were managing what we got through. And then as we are on the other side now, we've seen that really become more and more a part of our kids' daily life. Um, I like to take a little poll too for those in the room because not that long ago, decades, right? <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Um, I didn't have a phone. And how did I drive anywhere? <laughs> how did I get anywhere? What happened if I got a flat tire? Who was going to help me, right? And how many times, raise your hand, have you been on your phone looking for your phone? <laughs> right? So, yeah. And so these devices that we have with us have become part of our daily lives. And our kids see everything we do. They're watching everything that we do. We see us interacting. They see how we even might feel or get emotional, right, by some information that comes across on that device. And that's really um, what I think both of us are going to be reinforcing for you all today is what we do and what we model really matters for our kids. We know that three quarters of teenagers own a smartphone, 87% have access to a computer. About a quarter of kids describe themselves as constantly connected. How about in this room? Constantly connected? Yeah. If your phone isn't near you, I'm tapping my watch to figure out where it is, right? Like, we have so many devices with us. We're doing so much media multitasking. 50% of kids report feeling addicted to their phones. They have a social media portfolio, right, of multiple sites. They have a whole social media presence. And this data, I think, is a way underestimate, but they send a median of 100 texts per day, right? I think that's, I think that's low, honestly, right? Because I could see them sending way more. And we're not talking about all the different ways that they can 
DM, right? Do things in other media that maybe as adults we don't understand, but we're gonna encourage you today to really understand everything that our kids are utilizing online. And so with the spirit of JWB, I love the connectedness because what else do we do with our phones? We're more connected to people, right, than we ever have been before. There's people who've seen me um, from high school <laughs> decades ago <laughs> that um, people I wouldn't have normally I would be able to talk to, right, that I wouldn't have seen or been able to keep up with their families. That connectiveness, that um, opportunity to learn about other people, to have more empathy, there are benefits that we're going to talk about. But there are a fair number of risks as well, especially when we're not using media in a way that is appropriate and safe and in a way that can be a really strong consumer of the information being presented to us. Um, we know that an hour and a half of TV per day is a risk factor for obesity. Also eating while using screens. When was the last time you weren't eating a meal <laughs> with your screen somewhere near you, right? Um, we know that impacts the way that our brain understands satiety and how full we are. The advertising that comes off our screen. Um, I like to do this too. Raise your hand if you were talking about something with a friend and then it showed up on your social media about five minutes later. <laughs> you, you creepy little phone. <laughs> You're everywhere. <laughs> um, also changes our sleep habits. Anyone scrolling well into the night? Right? We make the excuse that our phones are alarm clocks, so it has to be right next to us. But could we maybe go back to that old digital beeping alarm to get us up? No, I <laughs> see Jen's telling me no. <laughs> um, but truly, our phones are with us all the time, and that, again, impacting us sleep. And think about our kids. If you've got your, sleep, your phone in your room, it's just as easy when you wake up at 2 a.m. for a minute to grab your phone, see what's happening, and then it's an hour later. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a reduction in outdoor time, and again, that increase in screen time. We've seen an increase in cyberbullying and sexting. 12% of youth between the ages of 10 and 19 have sent or received a, tech, a sext. So that's like one in eight, one in nine, right? We know that there's an impact on mood and depression, and we know that there's a negative impact on learning when you put all of these things in combination. We see a negative use of our social media platforms sharing risky behaviors, right? Um, oftentimes we see kids talking to one another about how they might attempt to hurt themselves. Or for our kids who have eating disorders, how they've been able to get around certain aspects of their treatment plan by using that information they're sharing online. Cyberbullying is a huge concern for our kids. Um, when I was in high school, number one, I had a corded phone and I was allowed to sit on the stairs for 15 minutes at a time while I'm sure my mother was listening on another phone, right? That's not what's happening anymore. I didn't know about the parties that were going on. I didn't know what I was missing out on from other kids around me. And if someone was bullying me, I knew who they were because they were doing it face to face. And now kids have, you know, Finstas. I had to ask my babysitter what a Finsta was. That's your fake Insta, right? Because you're using that Finsta, yeah like a fake Instagram, and sometimes you're doing it to like stalk your ex-boyfriend, right? But other times, and our kids are doing it to be bullying one another anonymously, and then they can shut down that account and open up a new one just as quickly. And so when I'm on panels, it's really exciting to be on panels um, with teenagers because this is their daily life. And they're saying, everyone I know has been cyberbullied, I've been cyberbullied. And that we just, you have to learn the skills to ignore it, right? We used to have a lot of data surrounding bullying in person at school, how you manage that as a school, but I don't envy the schools now because getting to that person who's actually bullying is increasingly more challenging. Not to mention our access to AI and how AI can now be used to model someone else's voice or model someone else's pictures that are not true but are developed in a way that can be shared with everyone. Um, also, as you know, our kids are still developing. Those brains are developing until age 25, especially the frontal lobe. And our frontal lobe is in charge of putting on a filter, right? Like stopping, hitting the brakes when our behavior is getting to be too much or knowing when to make a good decision. So I like to joke that the car rental companies are the only ones that got it right, right? <laughs> you shouldn't be renting a car until you're 25. But our kids are stress posting. Right? They're putting something out there. They might be sharing something impulsively because their brain isn't fully developed yet. And then that's out there forever. Whether or not they take it down, right? it's a screenshot. These things continue to be something that can be found time and time again. 
They also might find posts that are triggering, and that might set off a stream of emotions that we don't even realize, and the same thing for us as adults. We may come across a post that is triggering for us in some way, and we start to have an emotion or a reaction that's really impactful. We also see on social media, and this is something I want you to think about as you think about the children, the youth, and your own life, passive consumption of unknown contacts social media has a decreased quality of life. So if you're scrolling people you don't know or watching all of these YouTubers or different influencers you don't know in real life, we start to set that as the bar for what things should look like, what our life should look like. And in reality, that's not reality. <laughs> And so how are we teaching our kids to understand that? How do we understand that, right? We see all of these amazing people with these amazing lives, and I start to think to myself, like, why did I not have my child unwrap toys and video it? Because they're making millions on YouTube with kids just unwrapping toys. <laughs> but then these are what the kids expect. This is, again, the shift in advertising from thinking about a commercial that we used to recognize to a new YouTube influencer who may be between the ages of four and 10, or unwrapping a toy that now your child wants, right? Or thinks is what they should have. So we've totally had a shift in that marketing as well. Protective benefits are huge. I want you to totally understand that social media can be really positive when it's used with strong parameters and when it has really strong modeling in place. We see protective benefits, that social support, the connection, the community, the belonging that Whitney's gonna talk about as well, so important. If our kids are outside in any physical activity or engaged in any activity outside of the home, that's actually, actually a protective benefit against social media usage, even scrolling those unknown contacts. Our kids need to know those people that they follow because that, again, maintains that connectedness, that sense of community. And having social media has been shown for our um, youth generations now to increase their empathy and their cultural understanding of multiple different cultures. Interestingly, posting content is actually protective against depression as well. So if our kids are posting content, especially if it's positive, that's protective as opposed to just scrolling and not engaging or interacting. So one of the things I also like to share with parents because as a parent myself, my first reaction was, absolutely not. No social media, you're done, no devices. It's not realistic, right? It's in their daily lives, they're gonna go to a friend's house, they're gonna see it, and that might lead to unhealthy use. So when I have to stop and rationalize, um, as a implementation scientist myself, I'm gonna go to the data and look. And what we see in the data is really a U-shaped curve. So depression is highest, at each end of usage in terms of social media. So with no usage and really high usage, we see more depression than kind of the sweet spot, that lower part of the U in the middle. And so as a community leader, as a parent, as a caregiver, as a grandparent, you might be saying to me, well, Jen, what is that sweet spot, <laughs> right? What is that exact number? And really, we don't have it. It is all about the child and the family how we're teaching them to interact appropriately, what they're on, who they're following, um, all of those pieces in combination will help us to better set them up for success when they're engaging with devices, social media that they're going to have in their lives for the rest of their life. As I had mentioned too, more outdoor time, again, correlated with less depression, lower suicidal ideation. More social media time, especially in our females, is correlated with higher depression and greater thoughts of suicide. So when we have traditional media too, this is something I like to mention because we have screens of all types. And one of the other pieces, as you might be at home, the TV might be on in the background. If it's anything like my house, we each have our phones out, not my son, but my husband and I. And that's a lot of screens in one place with the news kind of maybe going in the background. So even the news, and interestingly, when I'm on groups um, of, with adolescents, when I'm on panels with adolescents, they're saying, we have social political concerns. We're getting information from the news, the more traditional news source. We're getting news from social media. They're taking in more and more of their understanding of a social political climate from social media as well. And so are they understanding you know, what is rooted in fact? It was for us, maybe for many of us, for me, you know, every night we sat down to dinner and we watched <laughs> Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, <laughs> and then the news, right? I'm definitely aging myself. <laughs> and with that, 
you had, I mean, it was one person presenting the news. And now we have that social political information coming from so many different areas with so many different perspectives. How are we helping our kids to understand how they sort through that? How do we as adults sort through that and be able to share that information? So I like to end um, with this data here because I think it's really important. So um, what you see, and I'm, I'm not gonna try to mess with the pointer, but when you look at this data, from about 2009 to 2011, we see these red and blue lines really start to head upwards. Our red line um, is completed suicides for girls between the ages of 12 and 14. And our blue line is emergency room admissions for self-harm, right? 2009, 2011, we just see these, these numbers start to skyrocket. Now again, as a scientist, I have to warn you, this is correlation, not causation. But what do we see right in that same time area? The number of social media platforms and the usage of social media platforms skyrocket as well. So we don't have good data on causation, right? We can't go back in time and look at this, but what do we see? A really big overlap in self-harm, completed suicides, especially for our females, increasing right from that same time period that we saw an increase in the number of social media platforms and also the utilization of these platforms. So just like when people like to compare it to getting a new car, when we first had automobiles, we got excited, but we didn't have those safety parameters in place. We hadn't thought yet about how we were going to be able to manage, set the rules, set the boundaries surrounding this new technology. And we see that happening, right? We see the legislature considering it. We see lots of different groups talking about it. All of you are here today with youth in the, the very front of your minds and certainly their mental health right there with it. So I want you to consider this, especially as we head into the second half of our conversation today. How are we best preparing our kids to be able to understand social media and to be able to comprehend that information? So with that said, when it comes to academics too, we see a significant impact. Greater reported rates of ADHD symptoms during the pandemic. There's a really interesting study. This isn't developmental ADHD, but it is because we've had devices in front of us, maybe multiple devices, we've started to have more distractibility and inattention. Now, again, I like to do the raise your hand, so raise your hand if you're now on a Zoom call checking your email and finding it harder to pay attention, right? And we got used to that because the demands of even what we're doing as adults was extended and expected to be more because we could be doing it in a virtual format. So we see that multi, the media multitasking really impacting us. And we know, again, and I hope that we can continue to reiterate this, the impact of media is going to be mediated by how well we can improve the enriched environment for our kids and have their adults and the trusted caregivers in their lives understand that social media has a significant impact on they feel, how they feel. This is tricky, of course, because these devices really do deliver our education now. Um, and we have lots of AI, like ChatGPT, who gets involved, right? And who might also, these devices allow for that really unrestricted access to information and how we utilize that. Um, so again, with sleep, we want to be monitoring our kids. They're at risk when they use more social media. They sleep with those devices in their rooms. They have a longer time getting to sleep, just like we do, right, when you might have your phone next to you. They have a worse quality of sleep, greater sleep disturbance, and more sleep dysfunction that leads to that educational impact. So I'm gonna transfer my conversation over now um, to a, a wonderful collaborator that we hear here um, from Nationwide. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much. Um, that talk was so informative, right? Now we have a level set where we know a lot about social media. And my goal for this presentation is to kind of talk about things that we can do to address it, and then talk about that importance of social belonging. A little bit about, um, on our sleeves a little bit, because I don't know how many of you have heard of us, uh, but we are on a mission to provide free expert created resources to every community. And we want to promote children's mental health because we know that people are going online and they're looking up information. And oftentimes, that information is not correct. 
and we want them to have the correct information, right? And so what we're doing is we're looking about what's trending, we're looking at the actual research, we're looking at our own data, and then we're using behavioral experts within our hospital, Nationwide Children's, and our healthcare partners, um, licensees, We Care Kids is one of them, and we take those experts and then we create content based on that evidence in a way where people can consume it and understand it. Uh, and so uh, here are some of our healthcare licensees. And so it's so amazing to be a part of this uh, county uh, uh, to have a licensee partner. And the reason why we want to reach every community is because kids are with different people throughout their day, right? And we are trying to talk specifically to those important adults. We want to give those important adults information about how to work with their kids, how to talk to their kids. So we're talking to the families and those caregivers, the teachers in schools, those youth-serving organizations. We're even talking to the employers because we know that what parents do and their children's mental health impacts that. And then we're talking to their primary care physicians. We are trying to make sure we reach the whole continuum. And we're doing that so everyone can understand and promote mental health. So first, we're working on breaking stigma, which we know is a huge barrier still there. We're working to increase literacy because we want us to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. There's a lot of people who use different words that aren't actually correct when we're talking about mental health and we wanna make sure that when we're talking about it, we all know what it is. But then the biggest thing is that we wanna give people skills. How do you build mental wellness? Just like when you go to the pediatrician and they tell you how to eat healthy, right? We know we all, all of us know we have to exercise, right? Okay, and eat our vegetables, we all know that. In the same way, we want everyone to have top of mind the things that can help them be mentally well. So we just heard a lot about the risk and the harms of social media, and I kinda wanna just spend some time talking a little bit about actual tools that we as adults can work with our kids to help promote it. Now, just a quick review, because we heard all of this, there are some benefits for social media. We can have stronger relationships, better understanding. Kids can explore interest and find community, especially for those who are marginalized or feel that they uh, are a part of a unique group that they don't maybe have in their direct community. But as we heard, there's a lot of risk there. There's a lot of FOMO, right, where you think you're just missing out. People are doing these amazing things and maybe you're not capable or popular enough to have those things. Um, there's a huge emphasis on looks. So we know that many people start to feel bad about themselves just because of that comparison that they're doing online. Um, things that you put online are permanent and now out there for the whole world to see, right? And sometimes in our worst moments, those things shouldn't be said out loud or in public, <laughs> right? I know you guys have seen posts where you're like, oh, they're gonna regret that, right? <laughs> We've seen those posts. Um, and kids, unfortunately, as we've heard, our brains are not fully developed at that time and can sometimes post things. We don't want that stuff getting in the way of jobs or college applications. So they're exposed to advertising, they're exposed to negative content. We've already talked about a lot of cyberbullying, that the bullying can actually go home with you. That stinks, right? You can't get away from it. And then you can pretend, right? And so there's so many risks out there. So I think it's important to just take a second to look at what we think about social media usage and age. Now, I'm not gonna tell you, obviously, we wouldn't want an infant to be on social media, right? They, they do, unfortunately, you know, I have a one-year-old, so I'm sure he does, he, I, I was late at night on social media while I was feeding him. But we really wanna avoid screen time with them. And even with our preschoolers, we want limited, non-educational screen time limited, right? Um, elementary, we, we continue to want to limit social media. We want to start talking about social media literacy. Uh, we want to watch things with them to see what they're consuming. Why do they like that? You would not believe how many times I see kids on YouTube watching things that when we talk to their parents about it, they had no idea that that's what was happening as a part of that episode. And then when our tweens, they're a special group because that's when they really start wanting social media, right? But my friend has their own account, right? And this is where it's starting to happen. And so this is when I think it's important to really start having conversations about 
what it looks like, when it can happen, and especially with teenagers, it's hard to manage. So the thing that I think is important, and you see that at a put a particular age, I know that there are some recommendations out there that will maybe say a, a specific age, but I'm not gonna tell you an age because I think that there are other things that I think caregivers really need to think about. Do you have a trusting and open relationship with your child? Or is your child confident in who they are? Do they respect boundaries that you give and expectations? And do they know the rules of what to be, like how to keep themselves safe online? Because here's the thing, oftentimes trouble happens when these four things are not met. And so I think it's so very important that you think about these things before you give a cat access to social media. And so also, all screen time, you know, is not equal, you know, and I, I love this quote, there's a huge difference between an hour spent shooting zombies in an app versus an hour spent composing music online, right? That's very different, right? And there's no judgment on what people do online, but I think it's important that kids learn online, they create online, and there can be benefits to it. And so I think it's so important for parents to have an idea of what their child is actually doing when they're on a media device. We just heard that passive is not really good for mental health, right? So how interactive is it? Who are they communicating with? Are they creating what they're creating? These are all things we need to be thinking about. And so media in all forms, including TV, computers, smartphones, can affect how children feel, learn, think, and behave. However, as a parent, you are still the most important influence. The parents the caregivers, the adults, you guys hold so much influence. And so I think it's so important for us to remember that because sometimes I think we think about our teenagers and we start to diminish our influence, but really we play a big role in how they learn to use these devices, what they see. There have been studies that show that teenagers often talk about how they wish their parents weren't on social media as much and were connecting with them. So I think it's so important for us to be thinking about how we are showing up for them. And so having a plan as a family can really be important on thinking about how to balance their time. So that's what I wanna talk a little bit about now. And so we created this great acronym, which I, I love it because it's GAME, which I think we all can remember, right? So we first, as adults, have to get a realistic idea, and this is the part that is kind of hurtful, because who really wants to look at how much time you're on the screen? Of your own social media game time. Just think about it for just a second. How much time do you spend in front of a screen? Okay, modeling that. The second one is asking questions, and I really think it's important for us to ask questions about what our kids like, why they like it, who do they want to follow, what do they think is so important about that person. These are types of questions that can really help us understand if they're ready for it, um, should we be encouraging or not encouraging it, and helping them think a little bit more critically about it. And then we have to make sure we monitor use, our use and their use, right? And then we have to establish limits. The thing about it is, is that these things were created to get us addicted. That's why they want us on it. Right? They're created for us to be on it more, right? So we have to be intentional about setting limits for our own selves so that we do other things, okay? So at On Our Sleeves, we've actually created tools to help families and caregivers do these things. We have information talking about just the basics of social media, where it reviews some of the things I just talked about. It has one whole topic about how to talk to your kids about it and question prompts. You'll see that Bay Care Kids gave you conversation cards, which is amazing. There are other kinds of cards that helps you start having conversations with your kids. But if you go on our website, there's specific ones on social media. And then the one that I really want to talk about is number five, creating a plan. That's where you sit down as a family and you decide what it's going to look like, how much time you're going to spend on social media, what are the people you like to follow, who has access to that account, how much time you're going to spend. And one thing is, and if that time is violated, 
not kept, what are the consequences that's going to happen? Um, and so I think it's really, really important to think about that plan. We also this year added some parts about gaming because as a pediatric psychologist who works in primary care, a lot of my teenagers are doing a lot of communicating over game. And so I think it's important not to just think about Instagram, but you got to be thinking about all the different devices they're on and how they're communicating and developing the plans for each one of those things. So here's just kind of a screenshot of what that plan looks like. What I love about it is that we really encourage families to come back to it. Just because you make a plan one time doesn't mean that that's it, right? Sometimes you got to revise it, just like we do our own lives. And then here are just some questions uh, that we have that are examples that are part of those conversation starters to have with your kids. So one says, like, how do you decide who to follow on social media? Those are one of the questions that can be really helpful. And then I love to put this here too because I think it's important for us to know the signs that we should maybe think about changing the plan. What is it not really going well? So if we find that we're just losing track of time, right? So we have a set amount of time but we keep going beyond it, maybe, maybe that plan is not working. Uh, maybe there's a preoccupation, a distraction uh, where we can't do the things in our real life, the offline things, when we can't do our offline life because we're so consumed about that online life, we might need to think about it. When we find ourselves isolated from people we love and care about, um, the biggest thing I honestly see in clinic that I really start to have you know, my alarm flags is this irritability thing. This irritability about asking what you're doing or can you get off of it? When you start to find that you're so mad about that, we might need to take a pause and think about it. When we're showing physical signs, right? Those things that we learned about, drops in sleep, physical activity, those things that we know build mental wellness, we might need to change our plan, okay? So the goal is if it's impacting our daily life, the life where we actually have to talk to people, see them, turn in assignments, then we probably need to change our plan. And so these are just things I want us to think about. So I, we talked all about social media, the good, the bad. I just presented some tools to you. But the real thing that I think is important, the thing that's underlying all of this, is that everybody wants to belong. We're on social media because we want to connect, right? We're looking for a community. And the thing about it is that and when this was touched on a little bit, we have been in a national crisis, our youth has, when it comes to mental health. We're in an emergency state. And one of those things that's driving that is this epidemic of loneliness that the Surgeon General released a report on. You know, it's widespread. Do you know that there is more loneliness than things such as people smoking, diabetes? People are lonely. And this isolation has been growing over the years every year since 1976. So it's not a new thing, but it's increasing. And among young people ages 15 to 24, time spent in person with friends have declined. So we're not connecting like we used to, and we're more likely to report that we're lonely. So yes, kids are reporting that they are online and more connected, right? But they are also saying they're lonely. And so loneliness and isolation hurt the whole community. Um, I love this quote by our Surgeon General. Social disconnection is associated with reduced productivity in the workplace, worse performance in school, and diminished civil engagement. When we are less invested in one another, we are more susceptible to polarization and less able to pull together to face the challenges we face to solve alone from climate change, gun violence, to economic inequality, and future pandemics. As it has built for decades, the epidemic of loneliness and isolation has fueled other problems that are killing us and threaten to rip our country apart. And I love that quote because it's so important that we figure out a way to work on building connection. So one of the things that I think about, what is the opposite of loneliness? Belonging, right? But I think when we talk about belonging, I want you to think about it, it's subjective. It's how you feel inside. And it implies that how you feel, that you feel important to part of a social system in which you operate, that could be your family, friends, school, work, 
community groups, right? But you have to feel that inside. And the thing about this belonging is it's innate. It's something you need, we all need. And so there's four components of belonging that I want us to think about. So they're all kind of interconnected. The first is competencies. You gotta have skills. You gotta know how to talk to people, make friends, right? That kind of helps you meet those people. You have to have opportunities to belong. We need kids to be in groups and uh, talking to others, right? And that's why it was so hard during the pandemic because it caught off some of those opportunities, right? We need opportunities. We also have to have motivation. And here's the thing about motivation. It's on a continuum. Not everyone wants to be social all the time, and that's okay. But the goal is, is that, and there are kids who are on, maybe on the autism spectrum who prefer to be alone, but motivation plays a big role in it. But the thing that I think is important, the one that I, la I, la I kept for last, is perception. Because you can be in a room full of people, and everyone in this room can say, yes, that person belongs. But if you don't feel like you belong, deep down inside, that's actually the level of belonging we're talking about. We're talking about how you or that child feels inside. And that's the perception part that I think is really important and the thing we have to talk about changing. So here's the thing, belonging is fundamental. We need it, Physically, our physical and mental health need it. And self-esteem, we often talk about it, but it's a measure of belonging. It's not belonging in and of itself, okay? So I think it's important for us to know that someone, uh, we could say they have high self-esteem or low self-esteem, but it doesn't necessarily mean it totally encompasses if they feel that they belong or not. One consistent finding is research in our liter research literature says that we need more connectedness. The more connectedness, the less anxiety and depression we have. And so we have, so why do we want to build belonging in kids? Well, like I just said, lowers risk for anxiety and depression. It protects against youth suicide, especially for marginalized groups. And children with social deficits especially benefit from increased social belonging. And it serves as a buffer. So here's the thing. There are times we all, and especially some kids, have experienced some pretty traumatic things. But if you have a place where you belong, that trauma, that, that, that horrible reaction can actually be less. We know that social connection in the adolescent years predict adult well-being better than academic performance. Think about that. If you belonged as a teenager, you are likely to say that your adult well-being is better than if you did better in high school academically. That, that blows my mind. So, we know that there are currently threats to belonging and their stigma, especially for those people who are in groups where they maybe don't look like everybody or they have some kind of difference, right? Then there are stereotypes maybe about them that maybe get in the way of them feeling like they can belong. And so we need to understand that because when we know the threats out there, then we need to counteract them. So what are some things that we can do to increase social belonging? Number one, we can build trusting relationships. Trusting relationships help create that sense of belonging. Youth from negatively stereotyped groups need to be supported, especially. That can help build it. And then there's also psychological interventions out there that could really help to treat loneliness. And so if we know that there is a child who's really experiencing loneliness, then that might be the time we want them to see a professional. And one of the things that happens in that intervention, um, here's an example of this cornerstone loneliness intervention, is that sometimes when you start to get lonely, you spiral and you start to have these things in your mind that says, well, no one really wants to hang out with me. No one probably likes me anyway, so I shouldn't go to the party, or I shouldn't call that person. And so the more that happens, the more isolated they get, right? And the more lonely they feel. And one of the things that helps in that intervention is helping the person to really look at those hypotheses that they've put in their mind and say, is that truly fact? Could there be an alternative explanation because maybe they do like you. Maybe they think you're interesting. 
maybe you are funny and they just haven't heard the right joke from you yet, right? I made that up. But <laughs> the goal is, is to help them see, that, and listen, there are times where kids are facing bullying and all of those things, and that is not what I'm saying here. But there are times when we can get in our minds and have all these negative thoughts that can move us away from people. And it's important for us to think about that, to see, is that actually true? And is there a group of people around me who want to support me and, and find me that group? So three takeaways. Belonging is essential to child mental health. It predicts good academic outcomes. And it can be increased, which I think is an important one to think about, right? So we have to focus on teaching strategies to our kids. How can they have healthy relationships? We got to make sure they're building belonging in school because that, that school belonging, that is a huge predictor. So that's talking to teachers. That's talking to parents. How can we get them that belonging in school? And then when you're uncertain that I don't know if I belong or not, how can we help them work through that when they're perceiving that they're not belonging? Because the longer we're isolated, the worse those things can happen um, for our mental health. And so here I just put some of the resources we have for that. We actually have belonging builders. We have resources specifically about how to help kids who feel like they don't fill in, why belonging matters for underrepresented children, and then why school belonging matters. There's a portion for teachers and parents in that section, which I think is so important. And then uh, I was able to help write this section on how to make friends. Because over the pandemic, when people were coming back, so many people, so many of the teens I was talking to, they were like, I just don't know how to do it anymore. Like, I, I don't know how to make the friend. Like, how do you start the conversation? And one big thing that I talk about in that article is we as adults have to model how to do it. <laughs> we have to show them how to do it. That face-to-face, -face, in-person interacting is so important. Um, we want teachers encouraging those student relationships. And then we know that certain kids have harder times. And we even have an article on how to build inclusive friendship for those who may be on the spectrum or have a developmental delay. And this is just a snapshot of those um, family belonging builder and then friendship builder. So these are ideas that um, parents and, and adults can do with kids to help them um, find ways to connect with others, which I think is a great, they're great resources. So you all are leaders in this community. And so I want this to be your takeaway. There are actual tools we can give our clients, our parents, our staff, when they're working with kids to start addressing how to use social media carefully, when it's the right time, how to have those conversations. We need to talk about the importance of social connection because that's the root of all of this. And we need to be connected, not just online, but offline, in person, and how do we make that happen? And social media, as our wonderful other speakers said, isn't going anywhere. So we have to be smart. We have to be intentional how we use it um, because we know our kids are going to be interacting with it. So if we seize this moment, step up for our children and their families in their moment of need and lead with inclusion, kindness, and respect, we can lay the foundation for a healthier, more resilient, and more, more fulfilled nation. And so on your table is white pads. And I have two questions for you that I want you to kind of think about. We're going to do some question and answer in a second. But I thought it might be important because sometimes we talk and then we leave and it was a great talk. But what I want you to really be thinking about is how can I take what we talked about today and actually take it forward in my own personal life, maybe with my own kids or in the work that I do with others. So how can I build belonging? We know, even this, this whole talk is about connection. We know the power of connection. How can you build that? And then how can I model healthy social media use? Those are two questions I just want everyone to think about. Um, and then um, I am done after this, and we will actually uh, take your questions now. Thank you both. We are, we are so lucky to have uh, both of you here, uh, and, and you tag team perfectly. And that, there was a plan. They actually <laughs> talked to each other to do that. Uh, but let me open it up for questions for either of our speakers. We have one here. 
And it's a question for whom? Uh, or either? I guess the second speaker mostly. We call her by her first name, which is kind of casual, <laughs> Dr. Whitney. Yeah. Dr. Whitney. Yeah. Dr. Maureen here. <laughs> um, so, well, actually, both of you gave excellent information, very useful. This room is filled with people who are working with children and those who work with children. People of my generation, our parents didn't get this kind of instruction. We were teased mercilessly, and it was suck it up, figure it out, keep going. Your resources for children or for adults helping children, are there also resources for the adults who say, I don't know how to do this for myself. Mm. I have the same issues that these children have. Do you have resources for the adults also? So we don't actually have specific resources for adults. I will tell you that many of the principles are the same. They are, so oftentimes I, I encourage parents to look them over and think about what you're going to present first to your child so that when you present it, it's something that you're working on together. Um, but we often, if someone were to ask me, I would then um, direct them to one of our partners who does more like a Mental Health of America or others who have more specific adult resources. There is also resources at everyone's table um, so there that people can also look at. So I wanted to make sure I said that too. But for now, our resources are for the adults to then work with kids specifically. And they're free. So you can also go to BayCare's website too and you can see uh, all the, the wonderful things that they're doing with On Our Sleeves too. Good morning, I have a question. <laughs> I'm a local pediatrician, so I work with kids every day. And was just wondering if you've come across any sort of screening tools or validated questions that we can ask our parents to start the conversation of whether or not social media use is a problem in their home. That is an outstanding question. Um, and one of the things that we always want to be thoughtful about with our pediatricians is not putting too much on you, <laughs> right? Because you have just a few minutes. Um, I, I haven't seen anything. I think maybe we need to make it. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I've seen any. Um, like any standardized. Any uh, standardized, yeah. yeah. I, I do know of a few questions that mm -hmm. like the pediatricians in my office often ask, which is just like, what devices do you use? Yeah. How often do you use them? And then. These conversations often come up in the context of sleep, mostly because they're not sleeping or physical activity, things like that. So I think right now they're like proxies for like what they're not doing versus I think they're probably, I'm hoping that there's a lot of research and work happening so that we can hopefully eventually get a short, because I know that's what we need in primary <laughs> care, a short questionnaire out there that can do a little bit better screening for us. And a couple questions I want to make sure you're asking are, do you know how to use every app on your child's device? Because just as a warning, right, there's some that look like something, like a calculator, and you type in the right code, and it's something completely different behind the scenes. And then who is following them? So not just as a parent should you have every password on that phone or device and be following on anything you can, including gaming, because that's a major piece, but also making sure other trusted adults are as well, so that you have extra input coming in. getting harder to be a parent. Yeah. Uh, other, other questions? Yes, Barbara? Thank you. I have a question and a suggestion. Um, I think you're expecting an awful lot a microphone. of parents who don't know media and social media, okay? My granddaughter is 23. I can't have this conversation with her. I remind her that the television was developed during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. Let's put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think for parents, particularly for grandparents mm -hmm. who are caring for children, this is an entirely new world. And so when you say, for example, you need to be familiar with the social media platforms your children are on, I don't belong to one of them. I'm just speaking, maybe there's some people in the room who are like me. Mm -hmm. I refuse because all of it is just insanity to me. I don't, I don't care about your business. I don't want you in mine. <laughs> yeah. right. So for people like me who are unfamiliar, disconnected, un this has not been a major part of our lives until now, these are brilliant suggestions that you're making. What I'm concerned about is the capacity to understand and implement them. So even in my office, if I have a problem with technology, 
I'm not going to sit there and try to figure it out. I'm going to call my assistant who knows it inside out and have her do it for me. I, I'm just going to respond as a parent, and you guys do the professional response. But um, I, I think I, I am a parent again, a grandparent raising two boys. And, and I, I, I feel very inept at doing all of the things I should for them. But, but as you spoke, it sort of reminded me of, I wasn't that crazy about watching soccer games. <laughs> Baseball games bored me. But did I go to all of them? You betcha. And told them what a great job they did afterwards. Who knew? Um, <laughs> was I into, you know, how to build a castle, you know, out of popsicle sticks for World Civ? Heck no. Did I know anything about No, but I went and figured it out, acted like I cared, um, made sure it was really their project, not my project. I, I just say that to say parents for a long time have had to learn new things that they really didn't want to learn, really weren't interested in, but it was what the kid was interested in, you wanted to be supportive, or you needed to know, you know, when you end up with a kid with special needs and, you know, you didn't sign up for that, but that's what you got, you learn. You know, it's like, oh, okay, I learn about you know, handwriting issues and perseverativeness and, you know, hang out with the pediatric uh, uh, occupational therapist, uh, go read about it, you know, become a quasi little expert in this slice or that slice because we love our kids. Is, is it a high ask for parents? Yeah, I think it really is. And I think it's, you know, especially hard for parents who are on the edge already, you know, don't have time, don't have bandwidth. But today, I think there are a whole lot of parents, and I think, Barbara, you would be in this category, who, who do have the bandwidth, who do have the intelligence, who do care deeply, and it's just a leap of uh, commitment to say, okay, you know, I'm gonna dig in, but tell me where to go and what I learn. And that's what I've appreciated about, in particular, the On Our Sleeves, uh, uh, pretty digestible, paths, they're not the only one who created some of those things. There, there are other family media plans that exist, but it's, but it's a start to have those, and the cards are a uh, start in having those conversations, and, and here, being enmeshed in this has pushed me to have more of those conversations with my two guys. Am I where I ought to be with it? Heck no. They're, and they're sneakier than all get out. <laughs> So I think I got it covered and then something, you know, the toothpaste comes out somewhere else out of the tube. So I think that'll always be the case. Uh, but I don't think we can, we can say, I mean, I'm in an older generation to be raising an 11 and 12 year old. I don't think we can just pass and say, it's really hard for us, so I'm not gonna do anything. Oh, that was said so well. I, the only thing I was gonna add is that as someone who also struggles, I, I might do some Instagram, I might do Facebook, which is also, it kind of ages me now. Um, the part about it that I think is at the root is that we want to connect with them, where they are. And sometimes, like, you know, they're older, we're just asking, like, well, what do you like about it? Show me, sh have them show it to you, right? So you, because sometimes it is like, oh, this is a whole new thing. But just having them show you and being interested, um, <laughs> can help you see something about them that you might not have known. And I think that's one of the nice things about it is that, you know, sometimes someone's going through something and they show me on social media the things they're following, it helps me understand where it's coming from or why they think they need to look a certain way or why they think a guy should date them this way because social media tells you can't go to this restaurant. I don't know. Like there's lots of things out there, right? But the, that allows us to have conversations about it. And so sometimes it's just like, how can you view it with them? Because sometimes it is hard technology and, and I get that too. Um, and it, it's hard to stay on top of it. But when we show an interest, that really means a lot to kids. I mean, sometimes they roll their eyes at us, you know what I mean, and they act like they're not interested, but deep down, every kid, my one-year-old, seven, 12, up, 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 want us to be interested in what they're doing. And when we show it genuinely, right, and ask follow-up questions, not in a judgmental way, because that's the problem. Like, sometimes they show us things in our face, 
our reaction makes us them not want to show us ever again. So we have to watch it. But the goal is how can we then have that open relationship with them so that we know what they're doing and they can come to us when it's not going well. So I, that's one thing I want us to think about. Like, how can we stay connected enough so that we know what's really happening with them? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to share what I think we all are feeling, that this is the issue of our time, the impact of technology on us, on us intellectually, emotionally, socially, uh, neurologically, familially. It is especially on our youth, but also on us, as we've heard today. It is the issue of our time. And it's big, and it's kind of scary, and it's hard, but it's going to take leadership, and it's going to take all of us. And what I just want to say is thank you, Beth and Dr. Katz and Dr. Whitney, for being in this and helping us get it started and getting it going because we have to do something. And I'm so grateful for you. My question is, can we have your slides from today? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got them. If you, anybody can just uh, ask me or April Pitchell. Or... Good morning. I want to follow up with Dr. Barber's question because the reality of it is it's not the grandparents that are raising kids. It is the great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so they don't know anything about the internet, mm -hmm. and they are still in the world where you turn the TV, you know, you had to actually, there was no remote control. So the reality of it is, no, they are not going to learn the apps, because when I had court for Zoom, guess what, if the public defender didn't go to that house yeah. and put the grandparent on Zoom, that child didn't come to court. Mm -hmm. So let's be real about the conversation that we need to have today. Those are the people that are raising my babies that come into my courtroom. What advice do I give them? Because guess what? I had a grandparent that says, my grandson steals my car almost every night. And because he's this big, instead of bringing him to you, they bring him back home. And so grandparents go to bed at a certain hour, and then the nighttime is the right time for the babies in my section. So they really do need some sort of help. Is there, is there a way that you can get with the grandparent agencies or something? Because the truth of the matter is they are raising these kids, but not with today's technology. They're so left behind. Oh. Well, so I was going to say, I think this is an amazing opportunity, too. I can't remember the acronym for what Beth and Laura have, HLHSB, yeah, I don't know. But that's exactly the conversations we're having. What do we need to do and how do we need to get there? And I think you just absolutely nailed maybe where we need to consider those next steps being because for even so I'll share um, from a, as a hospital employee, we've been exposed to more workplace violence and more social media being used against us and people don't know how to lock down their social media. So we're sitting down with them one on one to number one, make sure they have the resources to be able to do it and then walking them through. So that isn't going to solve, and I hear you 100% on what you're saying because we see these kids every day come to our emergency room, right, when they've stolen that car or <laughs> done something, and we need to figure out how to reach them, and I think that's a charge we need to take back to the board. Yeah. But sorry. I don't know. Yeah. That's a great question. I'm so glad you said that. I think it is something that we, I love talking with everyone because it helps us to think about our resources even more, right? And I, I do work with lots of great grandmothers and um, people in my community. And oftentimes it's about showing them what I know and then also connecting them with other people in the community that can do some of that wraparound. Because the truth is, um, it can't be all on that great grandparent too, right? Um, they have limited resource. And how can we build their resources up to meet that need? And so oftentimes, that's what I'm thinking about is, how can we get some additional helps at the school or with other mentors to kind of fill that gap in when we know that there's a challenge there? Because I do think it is still a problem. And kids are learning lots of things that we wish they weren't learning, especially younger and younger. And so how can we help equip that generation? There's a currently a reel on Instagram where they have a, a, a dad and a daughter and they're divided by a door and they ask them questions like, how do you take a picture? And the dad goes like this. And the daughter goes like this, it's like with the phone, right? And they say like, how do you make a call? And the dad goes like this. And the, dad, and the girl goes like this, right? Because their world and how they've learned it 
is so different than ours, right? And so hopefully what I think, and I appreciate you both for your question, is that we're gonna have to figure out that bridge between those generations. And so, you know, we have resources that we do think help a certain generation, and then what we'll have to do is find bridges to get to that other generation. But it's needed, and so I really appreciate that conversation. And know that, but we still gotta get the, the older generation knowledgeable, because I want them to know, even if they don't know how to use it, I want them to know what's happening. Um, because I don't want them to get totally left behind um, as we, we continue to like superpower our technology uh, every month or something. Thank you. Great questions. I need, I need to wrap it up so that we get anywhere close to when we told you all we were going we to uh, let you go. Um, it's very clear our world is changing rapidly. And uh, much as we might like to, we're not turning back. Technology's not going away. So we've got to learn to adapt. And we're at the beginning of, of that road in many ways and, and already behind because our kids know so much more than we do. Um, the rate of digital innovation is exponential. It's not going to slow down. It's going to speed up. The weight and the severity of its impact can feel just overwhelming. Uh, and coupled with this uh, decline of real-world socializing, which is uh, most evident among our youth, we have those things going on at the same time. We come into the world craving the presence of others and those early connections. Technology and modern-day conveniences actually invite, reward, and sometimes reinforce disconnection. JWB and our partners have such an opportunity to turn the tide, to lift up the value of human connections, and to reimagine community. We know that parents alone cannot do this. We know that schools alone cannot do this, that all of the parents and caregivers need support. Kids need to be hearing respectful uh, messages about how they can be healthier within their own digital lives. Uh, we can all agree that human connections matter uh, and that promoting digital wellness for us as well as our kids, uh, teaching responsible use is really key, but where do we start? So we need to arm ourselves with knowledge and we hope that this summit has created kind of a level set across this community and people who care about kids for some You've already heard all of it. For others, much of it may be new, but we've now all heard some of the same things and have a sense of what some of the next steps may be. Um, there are resources on your tables. There's a, a page of resources and that it, it includes uh, the Baycare on Our Sleeves uh, website as well as JWB's website and others uh, that could be very helpful to you. Um, everything from articles to more data guidelines and some practical tools. Um, we have a resource table filled with items promoting health and wellness for kids that are out in the atrium as part of JWB's Children's Mental Health Initiative. So please visit it, us on the way out. As we said before, we need to listen intently to our youth voice, pay attention, and allow them seats at the table. As adults, we need to be aware of our own love-hate relationship with technology and devices and commit to modeling healthy boundaries and balance in our own homes, in programs, in schools, in communities. Uh, more than ever, we need to let young people know at every age that we care. We need to be curious as adults, we need to ask questions, the right kind of open-ended questions, start conversations, and listen intently. And you each have a set of conversation cards on your, uh, on your table. You've probably all experienced the poor question, which I still sometimes go back to. So how was school today? And the answer is? In my, in my family, it's fine. So, there are better questions to ask than that if you actually want to know what's going on. And the, the conversation starter cards are a great 
way to think about that, and they may, you may use those questions specifically, and they may prompt you to use other questions that are in the same ilk. So, uh, so that, take those home. If you, you have kids in your life, use them. If you don't, pass them on to somebody who does. Um, we need to be kind and empathetic to the experiences and, uh, and the opinions of our youth. It, it is very easy when we get scared to just lay down hard rules that may or may not really be helpful. Uh, some of those rules, if you will, or when kids have access to what, um, do make sense. And we've got to boldly say no when the word from the kid, true or not, is all my friends, dot, 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 um, you know, to push off having cell phones that are also mini computers that, so that access to the internet and apps and social media is literally available 24 seven. That just needs to be pushed off as, as long as possible. And it may be a case that this community kind of comes up with what we, we prescribe as a, a good age for that. There are some communities that have done the wait till eight, meaning eighth grade, uh, that kids don't have you know, mobile internet devices, which is what smartphones are, until, until the eighth grade. But it, be, but it gets hard when the, all of these kids have access and your kid doesn't. It would be nice for the standards across families and groups and school, you know, PTAs and so on, kind of raise that level as a group, uh, either formally or informally. Uh, and this is hard stuff. Uh, we will need to be courageous, creative, and fearless. Uh, we will do some things that seem to work. We will probably do some things that ultimately don't work. Um, and, but if we don't act, we're gonna get the same thing we always got. We're not gonna get different results. So as, as we close this 10th annual Children's Summit, we invite you to take any of the items that are on the table uh, with you. The JWB Facts at a Glance, tell us about us. Uh, our gratitude journals, uh, which many find really helpful in their own lives, or feel free to share them with somebody else. Um, and notebooks that feature some wellness uh, uh, resources in the front that you can always have with you. We invite you always to visit our website or follow us on social media. We're pretty darn safe, we're good, we're positive. Uh, at jwbpinellas.org or you know, where, wherever that is. Uh, and please save the date for April 26th to join us at JWB's annual Kids First Award Luncheon That'll be in the St. Pete Coliseum. So I hope we leave with the question of, you know, how do we reimagine our community? And how do we make human connections a priority in all of the various and sundry ways in which we show up in the world? It starts literally with each one in the room today. And it's all about the power of connection. So join us to ignite change. Thank you.